Good morning. Aha, there we go. Good morning and welcome to the Crossings Church. If you are a member here, I am really excited that you're here. And uh, I'm excited about going into 2022 with you. It's hard to believe that we can say that, but I believe that God has some incredible things planned and that uh, you and I are both significant parts of that. So for the membership, I'm excited about being with you tonight and, uh, and this evening at our banquet. If you're visiting with us today, I am equally excited because almost every one of our members were one time were guests and a lot of them came in feeling very uncomfortable and they didn't really know if this was for them and yet God worked in their lives and have done some really cool things just as he had planned. And the one thing that we know if you're visiting with us this morning, whether God is going to restart something maybe that you've lost in your life, or maybe he is just going to start something that's completely new for you, that God has a plan to give you a life that is better than you could ever imagine on this earth and an eternity with him forever. And so we are a church that is involved in the process of making sure that we're living under submission to God so that we can live with him forever. And we want to invite you along in that journey. Inside of your worship bulletin this morning, there's a couple of things that you, can, that you can pull out right now. Number one, there's a little thing that's got a little quarter postcard kind of size thing that says celebrate with us. Tonight is our annual banquet, and it will be here at uh, Christian High, and we'll have tables throughout the auditorium. And it's just an incredible time to where we sort of reflect back on 2021 as we look forward to 2022. And the last couple of years, you know, with COVID and everything, it's kind of wrecked that. And it's been a bit of a, a challenge, but I believe that God is going to help us in 2022 do some incredible things. And I hope that you'll choose to come tonight and just celebrate with us. And it's open to anybody who would like to come. Uh, you can pay at the door, I believe, or I think you can get online. There's some registration also that you can do, but the prices and everything that are there are uh, there. We'll have some good food, some great fellowship, and a great look into the future. The other thing you can pull out is a set of notes that says Holidays. And uh, it is how to remember the purpose, we said in the beginning, remembering the purpose so that we can restore the beauty of the holidays. Christmas can become just kind of hectic for a number of reasons. It can be sad because you maybe have missed someone that, that was there last year, and it just seems different and even discouraging. But outside of that, which uh, I've experienced in the last few years, uh, outside of that, it can just get so crazy trying to, to, to buy stuff and to decorate, to keep up with everything that goes on. And a lot of that, from, from the discouragement that can go on at Christmas to the distraction that goes on at Christmas, almost all of that is solved if we look back at the original intent of Jesus coming into earth. So for the last four weeks, we've been looking at ways that you can remove the days from your holidays. And today, the last two lessons have been lessons that, that, that are designed very much, obviously, with everybody in mind, but really the last two, knowing that one was going to be right after Christmas and then one right after the New Year, these two lessons have been designed with the understanding probably there's going to be a lot of people that, that are in our membership that's here and not nearly as many guests. And while the message is, is appropriate for both, there's, there's a section, just overall, the last two weeks has been a call to the Crossing Church to make sure that we are living a life devoted to the Christ that was revealed at Christmas, not the, the Christ that we have created based upon what we want. Now, last week we began looking at a lesson called How to Change All Your Days. How does it go from just one day that's really good? And we had a phenomenal Christmas. We had a phenomenal New Year. I love those days. But how does Christ go from changing one day, one 24-hour period, to changing all of your days? And last week we said we were going to answer three questions. And, and so I want to just kind of summarize last week as quickly as I can and then get into today's lessons. But the, last week we said this, that how, how do you change all of your days? And a short answer was you trust the Jesus who is not the Jesus I would the, not the Jesus I want. You see, all of us, if you get on the internet, it is amazing the, the incredible difference that you can find in people's opinion of Jesus. Now that would be obviously true of those who are skeptics of Jesus. But if you get on the internet, you will find people who have a view of Jesus that is so incredibly harsh and unbearing that, that it, you go, where does that come from? And I'm not sure why you would create a Jesus like that because he's not the Jesus of Scripture. 
But then on the other side, you find a Jesus who is like a spiritual Santa Claus, and he is hilariously unconcerned with how we live or how we behave. And with that one, I can kind of look at it and go, that's how I want to get that. But between the harshness and the hilarity, just the absolute way that we distort Jesus, somewhere in the middle, all of us need to realize that it is very easy to create a Jesus in our image rather than simply embracing the Jesus that Jesus imagined for us when he came into this earth. And the problem with this is whenever we shape Jesus in our image, we limit Jesus. And in any revision, it may be an improvement, the new and improved Jesus who is more forgiving, or the new and improved Jesus who is more judgmental, or the new and improved Jesus who expects less, or the new and improved Jesus who expects more. Any time that we are involved in the process of revising Jesus, we need to recognize that it results in our diminishing Jesus. You will never make an improvement on the Jesus that's revealed. In John chapter 1, the Bible reveals Jesus. John goes way back to the very beginning of creation. We discussed in the first lesson. And it said Jesus was not just a human being. That's not where he began his existence. But he has always existed as God. And in the very beginning, Jesus was there, the Word. And then the Word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory of the only begotten Son of God. And so as you look at John 1, he says, listen, Jesus is God. So when you change Jesus, you change God. And whenever you change him, you are always going to diminish him because he is complete and perfect. So the short answer of how do I change all, all your days, we said last week, it starts with embracing and trusting the Jesus who is, not the Jesus you want. And Jesus, we said, came into the world in Luke 2, as he is announced by the angels, two primary reasons or functions that he came into the world, functions for everybody that he would be able to bless and say, that Jesus came into the world to be my Savior and my Lord. Now, in Luke 2, 11, the angels announced, announced to the shepherds, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Jerusalem. And they said that that's good news. And what I want you to know this morning as we talk and as we've emphasized last week and this week, the Lordship of Jesus, it is obviously a good thing for Jesus to save you. You know, whenever I sit around at Christmas and I look at my family and the functionality of my family, I'm amazed that I'm even included in it, let alone be the father or the grandfather. And when I look at all of my friends and the people that I hang out and a lot of their dysfunction and their lives that have been broken, and I come out of that somehow in the, in the role in who I am, I recognize that everything that happens on Christmas happened because Jesus saved me from my own selfish, insecure self. But I also know that as I look at him, the good news isn't just that he's a savior. It's a good news that he said, I'm going to be your Lord. Because you see, my problem is I was out of control and I thought I was in control. I thought I knew everything when I knew nothing. And I needed somebody who was going to take charge of my life. And the Jesus of the scripture is both Lord and Savior. But here's the problem. Most people then and now view Jesus the Savior as, hallelujah, that's good news. But Jesus the Lord as something they want to push back from. Most people then and now embrace the Savior, but reject the Lord. Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 19. It's a parable, which was one of his primary ways of teaching. He would tell a story that was very easy to grasp, but then it had a more significant meaning. It was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And in this story, he tells a story that sounds a lot like the story of Jesus coming to earth and leaving his disciples here, and he's going to come back and get them again, and someday he's going to come back. And Jesus acknowledges, and the people acknowledge that that's what it's about. But in the end, they, they mistreat Jesus in the story, and they hate the people who are serving him. And you can talk about why, and somebody says, well, it's because those servants were not, they were hypocritical. No, that's not the reason why. In Luke 19, 14, Jesus gives the reason why they so disdained his followers, and so they disliked Jesus. They said, we do not want this man to rule over us. They wanted somebody to save them, but they didn't somewhat want someone to rule over them. And so it is really important, though, that in Scripture, we said last week, that you can't accept the partial Jesus. That you can't say, I want this Jesus, but I don't want that Jesus, because then you get a fake Jesus on both ends. 
We've got to embrace the real Jesus. And the results of embracing Jesus as Savior and not Lord are significant. In Matthew chapter 23, there's a group of people who very much want to be saved by Jesus. They want him to be their Messiah, but they don't want him to be their Lord. And they are diplomatic of what happens with any group. And for 2,000 years, there have been people who are claiming Jesus as Lord, religious people who say, I, I, I want Jesus to be my Savior, and yet renouncing him as Lord. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute, but in Matthew 23, there are three things that characterize these people, and it will characterize you if you're someone who wants Jesus to be your Savior, but yet you want to run your own life. First of all, the results of raising Jesus as Savior but not Lord, the first result is my life will be marked by duplicity. In Matthew chapter, and if you want to, the, the biblical word, duplicity just means hypocrisy. Duplicity is like a nice word for religious people to not be quite so offensive. I'm a little bit duplicitous, sounds somewhat better than a, I'm just a big hypocrite. But in Matthew chapter 23, he says, people that are like that are marked by this because they will only obey the commands that they want to. So the ones that benefit them, they obey. The ones that don't, they ignore it. It lose, leaves everybody that knows them well acknowledging their hypocrisy. The second thing he says, it'll damage my, my, my life, will damage the cause of Christ. He said, man, you, you guys, you run over, you, you try to make converts, you try to bring people to God, but the problem is once they become one, they become twice as much a child of hell as you. You shut the door for those who are seeking God. And so here I am, I'm religious, and I'm saying, praise God, Jesus saved me, but in my inner being I'm saying, but I'm not going to let him rule me. And he says, man, you guys are duplicitous, and you need to know you are damaging. You are not a benefit to the cause of Jesus Christ. You are damaging it with your life. And then thirdly, in Matthew 23, and we've got Matthew 7 as a predominant scripture there, but I will be doomed on the day of judgment. He says, you don't enter the kingdom of heaven, nor do you allow those who want to enter. And in Matthew chapter 7, he says, I'm going to say to these kinds of people that I didn't know who you are away from me, those of you who refuse to embrace, to submit to my law. And that's the meaning of evildoers in Matthew chapter 7. So last week we just answered that question, what's it look like? And if you're someone who is trying to embrace Jesus as Savior, not Lord, I assure you that that will show up in your life. The younger you are, the less it will show up. For our young people, teenagers and our junior hires are Christians, what it will show up, first of all, is in your hypocrisy. It won't be very long until you're showing up in it damaging the cause of Christ. Rather than being a contributing factor to help your youth group and your youth ministry, you'll be someone that pulls it down, but then eventually you'll find yourself also having a broken life, and ultimately if you face Jesus without turning to him for who he is, you find yourself rejected by him in the end. Now, we said last week we're going to answer three questions. That was the first one. The second question was this. What does it look like to embrace Jesus as Lord? Okay, so I, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not just being religious, that I'm not just being a person who is saying Lord, Lord, because when Jesus condemns these people, he says you say it, but you don't look like it. You claim it, but you don't walk it. So that it's easy, you know, how do you say Lord? That's as easy as saying Lord, Right? But what is it supposed to look like in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in our lives when we have decided that we're not just going to be religious, we're not going to be just hypocritical, but we're going to be surrendered to the Jesus that the angels announced? And there are two major areas in Scripture that, that we'll see, but before we jump into those two specific areas of what it looks like, you need to know that lordship to Jesus will show up as submission Lordship to Jesus shows up as submission in my life and in yours. At the very heart of, what Je of who Jesus is, there is the idea that he is Lord and I am not. That he is king and I am not. That he is the victor, he is the one who leads me to victory and I'm the one who surrenders in following him. The Greek word for, for Lord is kurios and it's just a kurios, it's just a very common Greek word. And there are times in Scripture when it is used in the same way that it was used in medieval times. If you've ever, we used to go to Florida, and we still go to Florida, but we used to go to King Henry's Theater. Anybody here been to King Henry's Theater in Orlando? It was great, and then the English people bought it and ruined it. But anyway, so um, it, it actually shut down. So if you're English today, I'm, I love you, but I have some resentment for that. But anyway, 
Uh, it was this great dinner show, but when you came in, you would have the people, the, the people waiting at your ta- table, and if you were a lady, you were a, a lass, if you were a man, you were a lord. And it had some degree of su- surrender and submission, the idea of exaltating the one called Lord, but really what it meant was just, sir, how are you doing? Lord became, was, and even in the Greek language, it sometimes was used just as a casual greeting for someone that you were trying, I guess, either that you respected or you tried to impress but what you need to recognize is that it's never used in reference that, in that way by, by the followers of Jesus in reference to Jesus. The word Lord meant someone who was in charge. And according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, the word means he to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he, the owner, has the power of deciding. It means master, Lord, the possessor and disposer of a thing, the owner, one who has the control of the person, the master. So when the Bible announces Jesus is Lord in that language, with a capital L, then all of us need to recognize that if we've not recognized him like that in our life, then we have recognized as big a fantasy as Santa Claus is. Because that's not who he is. That under the suit of the Savior is the heart of a Lord, and he will not be satisfied in our lives until we give him that that position. And if you look at Philippians chapter 2 on your note, the Apostle Paul said there's going to come a time when all will embrace the name of Jesus for who he is. And he says it with the understanding that now those of us who claim to be Christians have embraced that. He says at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in submission of those who are in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He says there will come a time when every knee will bow, and yours will today. Growing up, when I was a kid, I was a problem child. Okay? Everywhere I was, the church knows this, everywhere I was, I was in trouble. And I couldn't wait till I was going to be 18 years old. I could get away from the lordship of Jesus because I was convinced I could do a better job of finding meaning and happiness in my life than Jesus could. And I was rebellious. And I am so thankful to God that he broke me and sent me to my knees, embracing him as Lord, and literally crashing to my knees as my life crashes in around me. I'm so thankful that I did that then, because the only alternative later is whenever I will in submission bow to him and confess him. But I will not confess him as Savior, then it will only be his Lord, because he will say, you're not mine. Any concept that you have of Christ being in your life as Savior has to involve Jesus being in your life as controller. And you say, well, are you saying you know, that, that you're saved because he controls you? I'm saying because you trust him. But if you won't let him control you, you don't trust him. My issues, I had lots of issues. I had lots of issues growing up. And I could have named some of them then. I can name many of them more now. But my rebellion, first and foremost, was founded in a distrust of Jesus. That I believed that I had a superior way of doing things over him. So it will be grounded. Lordship to Jesus will show up in submission in my life. And if Jesus is Lord, two areas that that will show up just to begin with. If Jesus is Lord in my life, he will determine what I believe. Well, here's what I think. Here's what I believe are phrases that come out of a believer only if, here's what I think because the scriptures say, here's what I believe because this is what Jesus taught. Those two other things are absolutely irrelevant outside of a context of Jesus teaching me what to say. You see, allowing Jesus to change the way I believe, changing, allowing Jesus to change the way I think is essential to being pleasing to Christ and becoming acceptable to Christ. It's not on your notes, but Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, I added this later in the week after about a dozen revisions. But in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, the Bible says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all he has done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice. He's saying give up your, everything, your body, your whole self to him, And let him be a living, holy sacrifice. And then it says, the kind that he will find acceptable. 
This is truly the way to worship him. He says, here's what you need to know. All of the praise that you give, all the songs that you sing, all the, the, the kind feelings that you might have are relegated to unacceptable praise if it's not coming on the basis of you surrendering yourself to Jesus. Then he goes on to say, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform, transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So he says, transformation happens into the image of Jesus whenever I decide I'm not determined how I'm going to think. I'm not going to determine what I believe to be right or wrong. I'm going to let Jesus determine what I believe. Then he goes on to say, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Do you realize that he says, if I don't embrace Jesus as Lord, I will never really be able to figure out what's right or wrong anyway. Because I won't be willing to listen to what he has to say because I've already got what I think is right. So if I'm going to embrace Jesus as Lord, I'm going to say, Jesus, what do you want me to believe? How do you want me to think? And Paul says, that's hard for us to do. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he prophesies about a time that's coming whenever that's not going to happen. He says, There's going to come, there, there, a time is coming when people, and he's talking to the church. He's talking to the religious the time is coming when people will not tolerate, endure sound and wholesome instruction. But having itching ears for something pleasing and gratifying, they'll gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors they hold. So here's the thing. Somebody who is not under the lordship of Jesus is going to teach and they're going to be defensive because they're wanting to hold on to what they already believe or because they're wanting a teaching that comes in that is going to be palatable and pleasing to them. And it's all about, it is all about their liking and their gratification. But when Jesus is my Lord, I don't look for teaching that will satisfy or gratify my liking. I'm looking for teaching that satisfies or gratifies my Lord. Do I don't give a rip what the scripture says, I want to know if it agrees with me. Hallelujah, I get to be right for one of the few times in my life. Right? Go praise God, I was right on that one. Blind squirrel finds a net every now and then. Or I can get right by aligning myself with the teachings of scripture. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Paul is writing to a church that struggles with selfishness. Selfishness is ultimately a struggle of whether or not you're going to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Do you realize that? Selfishness says, I want to be in control. I want what I want. Lordship says, I want what he wants. But Paul wrote to that church and says, we can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. And then here's the thing he says, we capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to Christ, the anointed one. He says, as disciples of Jesus, we are all about taking the lordship of Jesus and the thoughts that are not his are enemies of ours. They're not friendly to us. When we are defending something that is unchristlike, we are we're damaging ourselves. But we're going to take captive, like prisoners of war, every thought, and we're going to make it bow to the lordship of Jesus. Well, as we talk about that, how's that going to show up? Well, I'll submit to Jesus. In what areas? Well, I'll submit believing what Jesus says about sin. When determining what is right or what's wrong, Jesus gets the final word, period. And it may be that I look at teaching of Jesus. There are teachings of Jesus that I don't particularly like. Now, you may be going, I can't believe a preacher would say that. Any honest one would. Because there are some things that I go, man, I just wish. And almost always the reason I don't like them is because I would rather indulge myself, and this prohibits it, or I think somehow that it is, man, that sounds too harsh. That sounds too whatever. And while both of those emotions are understood, Paul says, here's what you have to do when that's you. When it comes to sin, are you saying that people who choose, whatever it might be, over selfishness, over human sexuality, whatever it is, are you saying that people who rebel and won't embrace God's views for sexuality are in danger of being lost without doubt? 
Well, how can you say that when some of these people are so nice and so sweet and so, and you have to go hold it. I've got to take this thought captive. I say it because the scripture says it. And that's my only problem with any behavior. If scripture condemns it, whether I understand it or embrace it, or, or, or whether I understand it or like it, I am called to embrace it. I can remember my dad telling me things to do, and I'd say, I'd say, Dad, why do I have to do that? And he'd say, because I told you so. And I never thought that was a good answer. And so when my kids, and I don't know if Carrie and Ashley remember this, I never said that because I wanted to take it a step farther. They'd say, why do I have to do this? Because my job is to teach you to be obedient. And you'll be obedient because someday God is going to ask you to do some things that you don't understand and you won't until you do them. So do what I said, because I'm teaching you to do what he says. And parents, by the way, that's your, one of your primary roles is to teach, teach your respect for authority. Ultimately, the authority of God, but it starts with you being that representation. But in all of that, as I think about that, I didn't know why my dad said it. I just had to do what I would, was told to do or I would hurt myself. Well, actually, I would be hurt, okay? grounded, you know, whatever it might be, spanked, whatever, a thousand things. And God says, listen to me, do what I say. I've got a reason. And you know the weird thing, how many, let's say a show of hands, those of you who have, who have children, how many of you can remember looking back and your parents telling you to do something and you thought, I don't want to need to do that, why do I have to do that? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody look around, keep your hands up, okay? All right, but look around that. Now put your hands down. How many of you, now that you're a parent, understand most of why your parents did what they did? It's just amazing. It's one of the coolest things is, I am so glad that God, after, you know, you ever, I think God gives us children to bless us from 1 to 12, and then he gives us kids to test us from 13 on up, right? But I'm glad that the teen years, somewhere in the mid-20s, are followed by parenthood. You know what I mean? Because it's when, and, and, and the older the kid gets, the more, and I, this was true with me too, because all of a sudden your relationship goes back to what it was earlier because they now get what you're saying. With Jesus, I am commanded to submit to him in what's right and wrong, whether I understand it or like it, about sin. When determining what's right and wrong, Jesus gets the first and the final word. Ashley always wanted the last word. She has a daughter that's very similar to her. It's one you don't know. It's not Hadessa, okay? It's, it, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I see had it. She's got to go and follow while you're talking about me. And she will try to get the last word afterwards, okay? I'm just telling you. I was like that when I was growing up. It's what got me in trouble all the time. Here's the thing with Jesus, for those of us who embrace him as Savior and Lord, and you can't have a Savior if you won't have a Lord. We surrender, we submit. It doesn't mean we like it. Submission carries with it almost the idea of not liking it. If my dad said, okay, I've got, I've got something I want you to do. What is that, dad? I want you to do, eat this Snicker bar with this glass of milk. Oh, dad, I'll submit. I know it's tough, right? That's not submission. I'm going, hey, I'm going to get fat here today. I'm called to submit. And Jesus gets the final word. I'm called to, to, to submit believing what Jesus says about sin. I'll submit believing what Jesus says about salvation. In Acts 4.12, the Bible says, There is no other name given under heaven by which men can be saved. That's one of those commands I don't necessarily like because of its implications. But the Bible is very clear that outside of a relationship with Jesus, there is no possible way for any man or woman to be saved. And whether I like that or not, it's not the issue. The question is, do I believe that Jesus is trustworthy or is he a liar? And when determining if I'm saved or lost, my feelings, my opinion are only valid if they're validated by the teachings of Jesus. On a broader level today, many have embraced the idea, there, there, there's a cliche, and I don't know where it came from, that, that all dogs go to heaven. 
Well, obviously, they didn't know some of the dogs that I was around growing up. But anyway, that's a separate issue, right? There's a little dog that chased me on my paper route, you know, and uh, I told him to go somewhere other than heaven many times, okay? But anyway, all dogs don't go to heaven. All dog... Here's what I do know is the Bible's very clear. Jesus said that all people don't go to heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, he paints a picture of two roads. One is broad and many people are on it. The other is narrow and few find it. And the idea that somehow that I can live outside of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior and be saved is foreign to Scripture. And while it's a teaching that appeals to the emotion, is a teaching that contradicts my master. So when it comes to salvation, what, how, what do I do to be saved? That's a question that Jesus must answer, and humans must embrace it. So I'll submit believing what Jesus says about sin. I'll submit about what Jesus says about salvation. I'll submit believing what Jesus says about sanctification. Sanctification is a big word that means to be set apart for a purpose. When referring to believers, it carries the ideas of set apart for a holy, a divine purpose. And please hear the word purpose in that statement. And I want to ask you, what's your purpose in life? Because a lot of times we say, I want to get saved, and I get saved, and thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. And somehow we think that what he has done is complete at our salvation. And in Scripture, we embrace Jesus as Lord in the salvation process, but we embrace him in Jesus as Lord as we live out that process. The Crossings Church is a church that is committed to making disciples of Jesus. We've been very upfront about that. One of the things we've tried to say is that it is clear that the purpose for Jesus' church is to make a difference in this life, that we're to be a disciple-making church. And so this morning, after we moved over in 2004 and started the Crossings Church, that was our vision. And now, after 2000, our 2020 vision, there are three other churches that are plants to where we lost over 100 of our members to send out to the plants. And they're meeting this morning in Columbia and Collinsville and in Maryland Heights in another church that we've taken under our wing in Tulsa this morning. Three of those four were staffed and are, are, and are, are, are made up the initial uh, composition was members of this church and somebody decided that rather than hold on to their purpose they were going to embrace their purpose that God gave them and as we go into 2022 our members know that we're in the process of trying to acquire land building a building so that we'll be able to function more effectively in our community and reach people but in 2023 we're going to revision again and talk about our calling and our purpose to send people out for Jesus into other areas that are similar to ours so that the lost can be saved and the saved can be discipled and I want to challenge all of you to embrace the purpose of Jesus because it is easy to just relish in the salvation that he brings. But I would suggest to you that the greatest joy that you will find is not simply in being saved, but embracing his purpose. I was on the phone. I was at my computer Saturday morning, I think it was. And a little blurb pops up from Juan Black. And I don't know if it was, some, it was on my Facebook page. And Juan is, does percussion. Where's Juan at? Are you in here, Juan? He's out there. And there was this post on there. Juan's a kid that became a Christian in a ministry that I was a part of in Alton, Illinois. He was reached by some high school students who embraced the purpose of God rather than their selfish purpose. Who decided that relationship with Jesus was more important than relationship with anybody else. And he became a Christian while he was in foster care. From a totally broken background, a mom who was a crack addict and prostituted herself in order to get the drugs that she needed, had never met his dad. Juan is now, I don't know if Summer's in here or not. Summer, where are you at? Summer. Stand up, Summer, there for just a second. That was a quick stand up there, Summer. That was barely submission, okay? But I'm reading the story for the very first time in Juan's life. He met his dad. And I am overwhelmed with excitement for him and joy. And I go down and I try to tell my wife, and I can't hardly get the words out. 
because I'm so excited that this man that God has developed is being rewarded by getting to meet the father that he never knew. And I'm dreaming about what that might mean for his father and the reunion of that family, just like Summer's parents became Christians because of Summer's commitment to Christ. And there is no greater joy to know that somehow you had a little role in that. And it's not because you're talented. It's not because you're smart. It's not because you're I'm any of those things. It's because Jesus is my Lord. And when I really let him be my Lord, he can work things that you would never imagine. But you have to embrace him as Lord. And sometimes our purposes come sideways and, and clash with his purpose. And too many times we reject the Lord of our purpose in order to promote ourselves. And if I'm going to embrace him as Lord, it means I'm embracing him and the purpose of him. The church of the Bible and hopefully the Crossings Church is simply a group of people who have embraced Jesus as Savior and Lord and because of that have embraced his purpose for their lives. And we get to see the exciting changes that that brings in our lives and in the lives of others. It's an amazing thing. So if Jesus is my Lord, I'll embrace him in, in what I believe. Secondly, if Jesus is my Lord, he'll determine how I behave. He calls the shots on how I, not just what I believe, but he calls the church, he calls the shots on how I live. I will obey his commands if he is Lord and Savior. Why? Because he's the one that I trust. But yet so often the religious and those of us, in, 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 whether deeply religious or superficially religious, this is a problem across all those lines where we think that somehow the words of our lips are substitutes for the walk in our lives, and it's not the case. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus is around a group of religious people, and they're saying, Lord, Lord, and he just looks them in the eye and he says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord? Well, you don't do what I say. And for all of you, from our junior hires to our high schoolers to our, to our college students to our adults, all of you who've surrendered your life to Christ in faith, been baptized into Christ, you committed to him as Lord, and I'm sure you still use that description at times in your vernacular. My question is, do you use it in your daily walk, in your decision making? Or are you more like the person, remember last week we showed the video? of the lady who decided to give Jesus the rulership of her life. He was going to set, let him sit on the throne. It was a stool. And she gives him only, Jesus, the stool, only when Jesus begins to ask something that she doesn't like, he begins to, she begins to shove him off the throne. She described it, Jesus described it, said, hey, you're kind of trying to double-cheek it here with me. Let me show you a continuation of that video. Lord, so it's time to go with Kat. Did you talk to her? Oh, well, Lord, not exactly. Did you forgive her? Well, Lord, I mean, I was just thinking, like, like I should, should I forgive her? Because I asked you to. Well, yeah, I can do it, Lord, but why? You should have to know why. I just that I asked you to do it. Well, that didn't make any sense, Lord. I mean, you don't understand the situation. Kat, you didn't have an attitude to talk about. Laura, you believe that I know what is best for you and for Kat? Then you'll do this. But, Lord, this is no different than when I've asked you to do anything else. Yes, this is, Lord. This is way different. When I asked you to quit your job, you quit. Well, of course, Lord, but I didn't like my job, so I'm happy to leave. This is way different. Okay, Lord, you know what? I've got an idea. How about we give you a week and I'll pray about it? Uh, I'll give you my answer now. But, Lord. Look, Pat's coming by here very soon. Coming by here? Let's go. Now's your chance to talk to her. I want you to forgive her. Lord, you don't understand that. Thank you. 
be like, hey, get up, Lord. Why do you keep calling me Lord? You won't even do what I ask. While there are some incredibly funny things about that, I'm, I'm amazed that she is so aware of the bad attitude that happened in that discussion that's there. Too often it's not funny because we find ourselves being like that. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says a lot of people are going to be like that. He says not all who sound religious are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still won't get to heaven. For the decisive question is whether they obey my Father in heaven. At the judgment, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we told others about you and use your name to cast out demons and do many great miracles, but I will reply, you have never been mine. Go away, for your deeds are evil. Now, when he says the deeds are evil, a literal translation of that is that you do not submit to my laws. You choose what you want. Now, obviously, some they do, some they don't. It's the mark of duplicity that we talked about. But it's important to realize the problem they have is not in their profession. It's not in the words that are you, they're using. It's in the practice and the way that they're living. And this isn't a matter of them earning their salvation or salvation of works. It's a matter of salvation through faith. The people Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 7 have a faith problem. Their faith is much more like the demons described in James 2 than it is the the, the forefathers, Abraham and those that are described in Hebrews chapter 11. If you read through James 2 or if you read through Hebrews chapter 11, in Hebrews 11 there's a list of people the Bible says that they were saved by faith. And you ask the question, it says by, by faith, Noah built an ark. Well the question is, was he saved by building the ark or was he saved by faith? And it gets in this big, big debate where I, that's, and the bottom line is, was he saved by faith or was he saved by building the ark? And the answer is yes. Because faith that is worked out in life, an authentic saving faith, James says, is a faith that always brings about submission and obedience in life. And it's so important, again, that we understand that, that whenever I am, when I truly believe in Jesus, I will truly be about listening to what he says and obeying his commandments. But not only will I obey his commandments, I'll follow Christ's example. I'm not looking for a way to live the way I want to. I'm looking to Jesus for the way to live that I should. In John 13, Jesus said, You call me teacher and Lord. And you're right because that's what I am. If you're here and you call Jesus teacher and Lord, you're right because that's who he is. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done. If I am your teacher and Lord, you ought to be listening to me to obey me, and you ought to be looking at me to imitate me. It's the kind of thing that faith does. To ignore Jesus' example is as defiant as ignoring his words. And those who embrace Jesus as Lord are marked by submission, not defiance. See, like every human being, Jesus taught with his words and with his deeds. When Jesus is Lord, I learn from both in order to become more like him. I'm not looking for a loophole or a blurry picture I'm trying to find a pattern to live by because I trust him. So what's it look like when I embrace Jesus as Lord? It shows up in what I believe, and it shows up in what I, how I behave. It shows up on my lips, and it shows up in my life. And the people in Matthew chapter 7, he said, here's the problem. The reason that's not happening is that you have a faith issue. The decisive, the clearest way of telling how I'm doing it, bracing Jesus as Lord, whether I really believe him, is to look at how I behave. Final question this morning. How do I embrace Jesus as Lord? How do I go from someone who is a non-follower to a follower? How do I go from a person who hasn't trusted him, someone who has trusted him? How do I go from being lost to being saved? How do I go from me being Lord to him being Lord? Well, let's read a passage of scriptures out of Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. 
Paul writes that he says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So again, he's pointing to this idea that faith is the foundation for our salvation. And it's going to be a foundation that shows up with a, a, a faith that is deep within our heart. That it's a sincere faith. It's not a, it's not a fake. It's not a superficial thing. It's going to be something that shows up with a confession that out of my heart comes this confession. Jesus is Lord, and it is going to result in me calling on his name. And that's what we'll see next. What I want you to look at in Romans chapter 10, though, is the emphasis on who he is, because the emphasis in Romans 10 is not nearly as much on Savior as it is Lord. It is almost the assumption that they want him to be their Savior, and the challenge is that, listen, you guys need to know that when you call on him salvation, you're calling upon the Lord. Notice what he says. For the Scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Well, who is a him? For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now we're going to unpack that because there's probably some prejudice that you have about that whole thing that's going on, but I want you to know that what he says is it is a sincere faith that you believe Jesus is who he says he is. He is Christ. He is Savior and Lord, and it results in confession, and it results in calling on the name of the Lord. But the basis of my salvation and yours is first and foremost the grace of God. That if it were not for the grace of God, it wouldn't matter how much I believed, it wouldn't matter how much I confessed, it wouldn't be, matter how much I called, if it were not for the grace of God, I would not be able to be saved and neither would you. So it's super important that while you and I understand that we are called by God to embrace salvation, we are not the causes, we are the benefactors of it. We receive it by His grace. So it's first and foremost his grace, and then a sincere faith, a faith that leads me to acknowledge the lordship of Jesus with my mouth, causes me to surrender my life to him as I call upon him as Lord. Salvation comes from a faith that leads me to believe, to have a change of heart, that causes me to look to and surrender to Jesus as Savior and Lord. And here's the thing, I don't embrace in Scripture, never were we told to embrace the Lordship of Jesus by bowing our heads and saying a prayer, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart. But instead, we are called to surrender our lives to him and to embrace him by surrendering. And in Romans chapter 6, that place of surrender is made clear that it's when you and I decide to be immersed into Jesus Christ. But Acts 2 has a connection to that also that's important. Because it may be that when you say calling on his name that you're thinking, oh, that's just a prayer that I pray. But in the book of Acts, it's clear that while it is an appeal to God, it's not simply words that are mouthed. So let's look at Acts 2 to see what the process looked like in Scripture in the first century church as the the apostles present it, because it's different than what it looks in many churches in our time. In Acts chapter 2, Jesus has passed... Jesus is ascended, resurrected, and ascended. He's gone. The representatives, the apostles that he trained, are preaching, and God begins to do some miraculous things, and they're speaking in languages that, 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 that others there don't understand. And people are looking at them saying, hey, these guys, look at them, they're drunk. Peter says, these people are not drunk, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's just 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not, they wouldn't be drunk even if they were drunk. These people are not drunk, since it's only the third hour of the day. Now, you skip down several verses, but in the context, then it says, but this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. He's saying what's happening here will be a fulfillment of what the prophet Joel says. And by the way, if you were to go up to Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, when it says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, if you have a reference Bible, it will have a footnote to Joel chapter 2. So in Romans 10, there's a footnote to Joel 2. In Acts 2, there's the profession inspired speaker Peter saying this is what happened this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved okay that's true let's look what let's see what it looked like in the first century 
in the book of Acts. He preaches the message and says, culminates it by saying, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Now when the people heard this, they were pierced to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of Apollos, Brothers, what are we to do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is you and your children and all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on urging him, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So those who had received his word were baptized, and there were about 3,000 added, 3, uh, but there were added about 3,000 souls. And again, I want you to, to see, as he challenges them and say, what do we need to do? He says, repent. That is a change of thinking and heart. Repent and be baptized. What for? For the forgiveness of your sins, and God will give you his spirit. Now again, baptism as in this passage is not a, a, a work of man's righteousness. It's faith embracing the grace of God. In Titus, 2, the, uh, Titus 3, the Bible says, and it's not on yours, that when the time came for the kindness and love, our, love of our Savior to appear, then he saved us, not because we were good enough to be saved, but because of his kindness, by washing away our sins and giving us the joy of the indwelling Holy Spirit. He defined salvation as the washing away of sins and the giving of the Spirit, and he said it wasn't because we were good enough, it was through his grace. And it's the exact thing in Acts chapter 2 that Peter calls for them to do. In Colossians 2, he says, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, not by a physical procedure. Paul contrasts circumcision and baptism. It's not a comparison other than by contrast. He says, circumcision was done by the hands of men in the Old Testament, but your circumcision was a spiritual one. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For when you were buried with Christ, when you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God and raised, that raised Christ from the dead. This idea that, I, that my, my sinful life is cut away by God and it, it's, baptism is not something that I, that I earn my salvation, but instead it is the way that God extends his grace. You see, baptism is one of the coolest things in Scripture because it combines Jesus as Savior and Jesus as Lord. It is the understanding that without Jesus, I cannot be saved. My sins have me engulfed. But it also, Romans 6, includes the idea that when you are baptized, it's not just a dunk in water. It is a death to your old self. It's this beautiful thing that God created to call us to embrace what the shepherds had announced to them by angels. And remember, the angel said he's Savior and Lord, and it's good news. It is good news for those of us here today that we have a Jesus who wants to save us from ourselves and our sins, and he will forgive us forever. And it is good news that we have a Jesus who wants to step in and control our lives and our destiny because he is the only one that knows how to navigate from this life, in this life, into the next life. A story is told in Acts chapter 26, retold in Acts chapter 26, of a man who was an enemy of Christ. He was on the road to Damascus. His name was Saul, and a bright light shone down from heaven, and it blinded him, and it opened his eyes. He was sent into the city to meet a man named Ananias because he didn't understand what was doing, but rather than going to the city to persecute Christ, he went to learn about Christ, and he comes to Ananias, and Ananias says, God has plans for you. And then he says this in Acts twenty-two sixteen, 16, as Paul retells it. As he speaks to Saul the persecutor, who will become Paul the apostle, Ananias says, and now, Saul, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on the name of the Lord. 1 Peter 3 says that baptism saved us not through the washing of water, but it's an appeal to God for a clean conscience. It's God's way of saying, let me give you a bright white line so you know there was a time when you weren't mine and there was a time that you are. When you were lost and in control of your life, and now you're saved and I'm in control. And the question I have for you all this morning, you've listened to the holidays, and all of us are in different points, but the question is, what are you waiting for? 
If you have never surrendered your, your life to Christ as Savior and Lord, what are you waiting for this morning? Maybe it's because, maybe you know, Saul could have answered that question and said, well, I'm waiting till I'm more certain about this because if I do this, people are going to try to kill me. And he was right. They would try to kill him, but he was certain. And he did it anyway. For others, it might be, well, you know, there's some little pet sins that I hold on to that I want to do. And, I want, and what you're saying is, I want to be Lord of my life. And if you choose to trust in you, Jesus will allow you, but he will not be able to work in your life. And it's weird how the sins that you love. I was talking with somebody this week that was an addict, and we were talking about this. He had lost a lot in his life because of his addiction. I said, isn't it strange how the sins that you loved as a high school student are the ones that you hate as an adult? Because then you were just looking forward to the party, and now you're looking back at the carnage. I don't know what you would answer, what are you waiting for, but I can assure you the right answer is I'm not waiting. Inside of your worship bulletin this morning, there's a cardstock piece of paper. And I happen to have one, coincidentally, wink, wink, fold up. And I want to encourage all of you to pull it out as I pray. So as I'm bowing my head to pray, you're, you're getting that card out, right? Would you bow with me? Father, right now there are people who are saying, man, I don't know what I'm waiting on. And some of the answer inside of them, well, I don't even know if I really believe in Jesus or in God at all. And Father, that's where I was too. That's part of the reason why I could never really submit to you because I had so many questions about if you were really real. It's hard to submit to a nebulous God. It's like saying, I'm going to lean on you only to fall through the fog that looked like a wall. If it's not solid, it can't support my submission. So Father, right now, if there are people here that are like me and have those doubts, Father, my questions weren't bad questions. My problem is I was lazy about getting answers. And Father, you put a fire under me as my life fell apart to look for answers that I should have looked for long before. But there are people here that have those questions. If they just check, I'd like a personal Bible study, God. I know that somebody that they know or somebody in their neighborhood will sit down and say, hey, here's what it means to, be, to believe in Jesus. Here's the reasons, even if they have questions, how do we know that they can look at some of the things in Scripture to say, and in history and in archaeology, that there's a reason to believe. But you said that faith comes as we allow someone to share the message with us, as we discuss and as we look. So, Father, the people who have doubts just saying, man, I, wanna, I, wanna, I, wanna, I need some help. God, for others this morning, it's not that they have doubts about the existence of God, Father, or the existence of your Son. Father, existence is not the problem. Embracing who you are is. Father, they don't really trust that your life, that what you teach is better than what they'll, they'll follow in their own lives. And Father, they don't really want to embrace you as Lord because they know that it means saying no to themselves. And Father, you give them that free will, but you don't give them the freedom from the consequences or the ability to achieve the blessings that they would if they would surrender you. So Father, if there are people here saying, I'm just tired of running my life, I want something better, I want to call the name of Jesus. If they'll just check, I want to be baptized. Somebody will let, sit down with them and show them how important it is to know that baptism is more than an act. It is an act of sincere faith in surrendering to you as Savior and Lord. Father, maybe there are other people that have problems with, they just have issues that they just have not been able to overcome on their own. Father, in their pride, uh, man, we want to try to beat everything ourselves so we can just act like we always had it together. Father, I talk a lot about the sexual abuse that I endured as a child. And Father, I, I thank you for using something bad for something that's good. But Father, you know and that I didn't even tell my wife until years after we were married. I'd always kept it a secret, protecting. And yet, Father, what I had protected had really not protected me. And it hadn't allowed you to work. And so, Father, what I've discovered is that when we give our struggles to you and to your people... It's amazing how much strength that you give to us. So whether it's the guilt of having an abortion, whether it's the struggle with pornography or a drug addiction or issues that we have from being abused as children, God, you have answers for those. And the crossings, the coolest thing is, the people who lead most of those groups are people who are leaders in our church. Father, we are not those who born having, were born having it together. We were the broken that you put together. 
And Father, the great ability we have to testify in faith, but not only in faith, but because we've seen it time and time again. So Father, if there are people here that just go, man, I got problems, and I maybe even have blamed God, I've been angry at God, if they'll just write a prayer request or check one of those boxes, they can get help this morning, that you will save them from themselves, and as you direct them, you will navigate for them how they can come through and even turn a burden into a blessing. And Father, for the Crossings Church, this lesson, God, as we end with a call of what it means to be saved, Father, I hope that we'll all remember that the call to being saved is a call to surrender, that you are the same Lord, not the same being that we manipulate to our liking and that we continue to live how we'd like. Father, I pray that this church and every member will examine themselves as we go into the new year because you have great plans but, Father, those can't, plans can't be fulfilled unless we're willing to follow your instructions. And, Father, I think there's, there's, there's a, a group probably of people right now in the audience this side that say, yeah, I go to church. I, I'm very much religious, but I really have not surrendered. I've taken up that surrender, and I live for myself again. And I pray that as we go into 2022 that this morning they will say, I surrender to Jesus as Lord, and I appreciate his salvation. So whatever it is, Father, move us to think. Move us to write on that card. And then after the last song, there are baskets at the end of the aisles. And as you go out the doors, Father, I pray that we'll just drop those cards in the basket for our members. We need their card that shows their commitment to you as Savior and Lord. Father, we need their example of growth for those that are around them. And Father, we need their contribution to keep the ministry going. Father, for our guests, we ask only that they give you a chance to make a difference in their lives by filling out that card and dropping it in. So, right, Father, right now, help us to move in our hearts. May your spirit convict us. Father, not that we are going to be lost forever, but that we are guilty and need saving. And may that, Father, convict us and turn to you. May we write on that card, and then may we drop in the basket, Father, by your power and by your grace. Move us to think as the worship team sings. Move us to write, and then move us to respond, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.